Hello and welcome to this mini lecture on semiology and popular culture. So the image I have in front of you is a famous piece of art and it is named The Treachery of Images by René Magritte. And in the French that's right there, if you don't know French and that's fine, because uh, I certainly don't, despite trying, what it says is this is not a pipe. Right? So let's think about that. This is not a pipe. What, is that, what does that mean? Uh, does it look like a pipe? Yes, but it's not a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. It is not a real thing. And we could take this, you know, we could take this very, very far in that what you're looking at is not even a representation of a pipe. Right? This is not the painting that Magritte did. Magritte did a painting that's sitting in a museum somewhere. This is a reproduction of a reproduction of a pipe. Even more so because you're looking at it most likely on the internet in a video. So you're looking at a reproduction of a reproduction of a reproduction of a pipe. And I like using this to get into our talk about semiology because we're talking about representation and I think it's important as we talk about representation to be thinking about kind of what we're representing what we're you know what we're signaling because we live in a world in which we're looking at a lot of things we think are real but technically aren't um, they're representations of what's going on when we're watching video it doesn't matter if it's live video we're not watching what's really going on we're watching a bunch of digital bits that have been recomposed onto our screen to show us a representation of and I think that's important because so much of what we're being shown can be manipulated in a lot of different and problematic ways alright so let's get into semiology semiology is the study of signs usually within a particular culture and I think that's important because it's you can study signs across culture but it gets much more problematic so when we look at when we look at something um, we have the denotation and the connotation right and you may remember these words from you know an English course in which we, you know you talk about the denotation is specifically exactly what it means right the, exactly what a word means it's what it denotes connotation is what the word may imply what the word hints at right so if we think about this you know if you say something looks if you say somebody looks big versus somebody looks fat you're connotating different things right cuz you could essentially that that denotation could uh, there, there's very similar meanings but you're connotating something else you're you're passing judgment you're you're putting a little bit more um, negative on when you use the term fat versus a little bit more um, respectful or, or just massaging the information differently. Alright, so semiology is interested in those connotations, is interested in what's going on with that. And that's what we want to try to get under. We want to understand, first of all, uh, that semiology doesn't presume universal signs but it does know that signs are universally used, right? So if you have a sign, some kind of representation, that's not necessarily universal across worlds, you know, across the world or across cultures. But we do know that every culture uses signs. And you can say, well, how do you know that's true? You know, how, how, can, how can you prove that? It's very simple. Language itself is a sign system, right? We're using words, which are arbitrary sounds, just sounds randomly decided to represent things in the world, right? Because if I say tree, there's nothing inherently about what a tree is that makes us name it tree. That's just the English name that we've, we've determined. So if you are a culture, you have created a variety of sign systems, including language, in order to exist. Signs are wonderful shorthands, right? We have them there to kind of negotiate quickly through lives, through our life, and through culture. And, you know, within this, what to kind of think about is that the material world is not just given, but made intelligible by signs. So, again, if we look at words, 
um, they make the material world intelligible. If I tell you to go get the spoon, you know what the spoon is. You don't have to, tr you know, I don't have to spend lots of time, I don't have to draw it out, which is, again, another symbol, is another representation. Um, but we make sense of the world, the material world, by labeling everything. We have, you know, we have books and cows and tables and chairs and all of these things that guide us towards what it is they are, even though they aren't inherently that. There's nothing inherently about a cow that designates it the name of cow. And these cultural systems of meaning are never innocent, right? And so this, this is where it starts to get interesting or at least for, for, popular, for the purpose of studying popular culture, this is where it gets important. They're never innocent. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're nefarious, but they're never not without purpose. And that's something we should be aware of and be thinking about. So we always, always, you know, a, a sign in and of itself is connected to some kind of sign system. And so those sign systems could be language, religion, education, politics, uh, body language, you know, th there's always connected to some kind of larger sign system. So whenever we look at a sign, that's what we want to think about is what's the larger system it's connected to. Alright, so this is a, a really good uh, way of, of summarizing or, or explaining what's going on here. So we have the sign, that's the big thing, right? And embedded in every sign is a signified in a signifier. So this is a little different from structuralism, which just has a signifier and signified. So within semiology, what we see is the sign is the signification, the, the whole meaning. So let's use, for example, the finger, right? Somebody gave you the finger. What would be the signifier would be the form, right? The middle finger, right? So the sign as a whole, if somebody says to you, ah, oh, he gave me the finger, right? That's the sign. But what actually is the form of that sign is the actual middle finger extended on one's hand. And what that signified is the, you know, what we're looking at with signified is the meaning, is the concept behind that, which is, you know, F you. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about a sign. Now that is connected to a larger system of signs, which is body language, and in particular, you know, American body language. Because the finger, what we consider the finger, doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in other cultures. So when we talk about being given the finger, don't you love that this is what the topic is, or this is what we're using? But I think it's one that works really well. Uh, but when we talk about giving the finger, right, we're talking about what that means within American culture and the American sign system. In other cultures, it's actually giving the peace symbol, or what we think of as giving the peace sig signal. So if you ever go abroad, you really want to be careful and not necessarily go giving people the, the peace signal, because that could really have some problems. All right, so, and then within all of this, we have myth, and this ties into structuralism a bit, and this is kind of, uh, you know, the, the larger unifying element that is related to this, or this is kind of, we have that what it means, but it's also, you know, the signified of what it means, but also what it means in the larger context. And this, this can sound a little meaty, but we're going to take a look at it as we get further. So this is the second order of a semiological system. This is the, the big idea that it's connected to. Um, so even something like, in this case, the, the concept of FU, that's, you know, what does that tie into? That ties into our larger rebellious identity within American culture. So there is there is ways in which you can connect this to even a bigger sign system, or as a, this you know as I say, a second order semiological system, and this is something that's either inter underneath or superimposed on the initial system. So you have sign signifier signified, right, and that all happens in one immediate moment, but all of that is tied to a higher understanding within our culture. So depending on who told you. F you, you might find, you know, you might tie that to, oh, kids today, 
right? And there's a mythology about kids today being so horrible. Uh, or you might tie that to, you know, standards or morals today are so horrible, and it's because of popular culture. So that might be another myth that you connect with or connect it to. So here's an interesting symbol, the American flag. And so we want to think about here, what is the sign? What is it, you know, what is, what's the signifier? What's the signifier and what's the signified? All right, so here we have the sign is the, uh, you know, the American flag. What's the actual signifier? What is the flag itself, that physical flag, right? We have that physical flag and we've labeled it as the American flag or the U.S. flag. And there's a certain, you know, it's no longer just a flag, but it's an American flag. And once it becomes an American flag, what it's signaling is, of course, the United States, right? And, and what the United States is supposed to represent. And, of course, if we look at the myth, right, that second semiological dynamic, the United States is supposed to represent freedom in the individual, Right, so this is what we're looking at. This is what we're playing at. Let's take a look at another example. The Nike swoosh. So the sign is, of course, the Nike, logo, the Nike logo. The signifier is what it actually is, that little swoosh thing that you see on, on all Nike products. And it signifies, or th what's signified is Nike, right? And kind of what ni Nike as a company. But the myth is of course empowerment, right? Remember the, the slogan, just do it, right? That was a very, very powerful and, and well done statement. And that is what Nike tries to establish itself as its mythology is about empowerment, that you wear this, sh this shoe, you wear this hat, you wear this artifact of Nike and you will be able to go far. And so what we understand is the relationship is made explicit to a point that it's almost natural right that the flag naturally means freedom right that you don't you know when semiology is being is being done and is is effective you find that these relationships feel almost natural that is you look at the flag and instantly you think uh you know that that it's freedom or, or it's you know this is that's what it means and it you it's used as a stand in regularly uh throughout the culture as such which is why there's so many interesting discussions around what happens to, you know, what happens if somebody desecrates the flag? Should they, sh should we allow for that? Um, that's been a discussion that goes, you know, all the way back to the Vietnam War and flag burning and the like. So in, I think it's important that, you know, in, in many cases we see the myth as true. We don't question it. It's just part of our means of communicating. That is, there's no question that the American flag represents freedom or that Nike is this, you know, the, embodies empowerment. Um, that's just, you know, the, the, there's so, it's so powerful a relationship that it just seems natural, that it's just, uh, you know, a matter of fact. And it's interesting with signs um, what this can mean. Like if we say, if we say so, somebody drives a hybrid, if we say, oh, he drives a hybrid, it's very interesting to see what that implies within or what the symbolism is going on there about this particular person and his values and what's true about him. All of a sudden, various things are assumed. There are certain truths that he falls into, right? If he drives a hybrid, then he must care about the environment, then he must, dis you know, he must fall into these types of categories. Um, so this is where it can get challenging or, or concerning because if we create these sign systems around people or around identities, boy, do we start to put people in boxes and assume truths. And we certainly have seen this with gender and race and ethnicity and class that we have, you know, we've created this sign system around it. You know, when we say a wino, we have a whole sign system. We have a whole mythology around what a wino is. It's somebody who's homeless. He's drinking alcohol, and it's typically a he that we think of. You know, drinking alcohol out of a paper bag or, or you know, is, is dirty, is, is, you know, out of control or is not able to maintain himself and the like. Uh, this is the mythology that we, we tap into with just phrases like that. 
All right, so hopefully this gives you a sense of semiology and, and kind of how it works and be thinking about it in relation to structuralism and hopefully you can kind of start to look in at popular culture and start to use these tools. Thank you very much for watching.